Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Well, last week was a powerful, powerful uh, message uh, breaking down Ephesians 2, 11 through 18, and we're including a little bit of 17 and 18 today of Ephesians. And there was a question I had as I was reflecting on this scripture today, uh, just throughout this week. And the question that I had was, is how do you, how do you possibly unite uh, so many different nations together, so many different people groups and how do you unite, unite them? And then how do they get along? They would, it would have to be some powerful force, the greatest force in the universe to do that. And then, and then how, do you, how do you get a, a community of people to live in, in similar ways? Um, in other words, in a certain standard, like the way of Christ. And it would have to be the perfect example of how to live. And so the person we're talking about, the only one who's powerful enough to, to unite all mankind and even work on hearts and minds to live a certain way would have to be Jesus. There, there is no one else who successfully has, has done that in, in civilization. And Jesus has been the most effective person to bring so many different people together. And that's actually what we read about last week is pure enemies, people who were both very hostile to each other, became one family and lived in unity together. But the question is, is how do you keep that that way too? Well, the only thing I can think of is Jesus Christ, and the Bible calls him in our scripture today, the cornerstone, which holds all things together in a building. And so Jesus is holding the church together uh, as the body of Christ. So let's get into our scripture today. And um, we do have a cornerstone here. I'll bring it up later on a table as a visual to help you understand that. So Ephesians 2, and we're going to start with verse 17. It says, He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Just a review if you're new today, Gentiles are any nation that's not a Jewish, uh, the Jewish community. So any nation. It could be Samaritans. It could be Romans, Greeks, all right? Now, all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. So let's break this down a little bit. The first thing I want us to do, because this I talked about this last Sunday, I want to go a little bit further in one part, and that's that last verse. It says, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because what Christ has done for us. How does God unite so many different people into one body, one way of life, one fellowship? Well, it's through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus and through himself, God. The entire Trinity is at work. The entire person of God and the wholeness of God is at work to do the uniting of all mankind, but it has to be in Christ. And we see that in Scripture, the role of the Holy Spirit is to carry on what Christ has done for us because the Holy Spirit would be uh, coming to earth when Christ would leave and to be ascended and ascended with, to be with the Father. So that's when the Holy Spirit came and the Holy Spirit carries on that work. When I read that verse, the story that came to my mind was when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan at the well, the Samaritan woman. 
And they were talking and she was basically asking, and I'm going to paraphrase today, she was basically asking, you know, why is it that the Jews say that you worship in Jerusalem at the temple and we, we worship as Samaritans at Mount Gerizim? And, and Jesus said, there will be a day where it doesn't matter where you worship because you will worship in spirit and in truth. We're going to be one body, in other words, as long as you have the spirit of God in you, you will worship me no matter where it's done at. There's not one true place to worship me. It's going to be wherever you worship me. That's how he begins, he begins to unite people, uh, no matter where we are. Right now, around the world, people are worshiping just like us. It, it may look different, but the reality is we're all part of the family of God through the Holy Spirit. And then Acts 10, 44 through 46 is, is this powerful story where Peter is a Jew and he's going to Cornelius' house, who is a Roman leader, and he's going to his home because there was a vision that connected those two together, and Cornelius was supposed to bring Peter to his house. Peter had a vision that all people can be uh, in the family of God, and so he goes to Cornelius' house and preaches the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. As he's preaching this gospel to these Gentile people, they begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, speak in other tongues. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they, were, and they were praying in the Spirit. And so it was evidence that the Holy Spirit, that the presence of God is willing to dwell even in Gentiles, not just Jews. Just, that's just another example, a proof text of what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, that the promise of all these blessings wasn't just for the Jewish community, it was for all nations to come to God. All people could be saved if they believe in Jesus Christ. And when you believe in him, you are in the family of God, no matter your background, no matter your status, position, wealth, nothing. It doesn't matter. Jesus makes us one people. It's amazing. So it takes the Holy Spirit to do that. Now, Paul's usual language in this scripture, uh, 2, 11 through 22, comes up once again in verse 19. He says, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all God's holy people. The word citizens here kind of points to this visual and this idea of a kingdom. There's this eternal, invisible kingdom with God, and we're all citizens of God's kingdom. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, that's connected. Anyone who believes in Jesus is a citizen of his kingdom. And with that comes the greatest king in the world, Jesus Christ. Not like a jerk king, okay, but the best king. The one that would hang out with the citizens. The one that would get close to the citizens. The one that would treat the citizens well. The one that would feed them and make sure they're not hurting and that they're doing well. That's the king we serve in the kingdom we live in. I thank God for that. He says, you are members of God's family. What we see in these scriptures is Paul uses three analogies in, uh, in verses 17 through 22. He uses citizenship, family, and a building. In verse 16, he uses a body. So Paul is a master teacher, and he loves using analogies to help you understand, help them understand how connected we are, and to help the Gentiles understand what they've inherited because of what Jesus Christ has done for them. So because Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and gave them new life when they believed in him, they are citizens, they are family of God, they're part of the building or the temple of God, and they are part of his body. That's the, that's the body, by the way, is Paul's favorite analogy for explaining the church and how we're together as one body. All right? Ephesians 2 20. We're moving along here. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. Now, when I first read this, I thought for sure that, that basically Paul is talking about the Old Testament prophets who prepared the way for Jesus, who prophesied about him hundreds of years before, but doing further study it's actually referring to the apostles and, and the prophets or even the apostles speaking on behalf of God. You can see a lot of that happening in the book of Acts. Some people may think it's even John, John the Baptist, but the New Testament apostles and prophets were the ones who helped lay down the foundation for the Gentiles being included into the family of God. 
Now, the reason why scholars think that it's not talking about the Old Testament prophets is because anywhere Paul uses the words apostle before prophets, he's talking about New Testament era forward. And he uses it three times. He never says prophets and then apostles. If it was prophets and then apostles, then he would be talking about the Old Testament prophets and then the New Testament apostles like Peter, James, and John, and even himself. So the foundation was set. Now let me explain that. Let me show you. The foundation is the work and ministry of Jesus Christ through the apostles and prophets of the New Testament. So leaders and those who worked for Christ in the New Testament. But that's important because this was the groundwork for the Gentiles to know God and be part of the family of God. And it took Paul himself to go make sure they knew that they are welcomed in the family of God. So what is the cornerstone? What is the cornerstone? Paul is thinking of this scripture, Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, not a physical stone. He's talking about Jesus Christ, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. Anyone who believes in Jesus need never be shaken. Yes, it's okay if you get a little excited. That's what Paul is referring to. This is, this is prophecy hundreds of years before, maybe around 900 years, being fulfilled in Jesus Christ 900 years later. Okay? And the cornerstone, it was referring to a person, not a physical piece of architecture. But I'm using, I'm using that today as a visual. Now, first Peter. Now, Peter says a similar thing. And Peter's using the same reference, the same Greek word, and the word that would correlate to Isaiah. And he says, you are coming to Christ. So those who are saved, those who are believing in Jesus, you're coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone. So it obviously can't be a physical cornerstone because it's alive of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living, you are, I'm sorry, and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Now, this is really interesting. Paul is not talking to priests or pastors here. He's actually, he's written this to the church. So you and me, he's saying because of Christ, we are now like priests. And we're holy priests. In other words, our lives help worship, lead worship. We worship God. Together, we are worshiping God when we live. It used to be just the priest who did all the work and the priest who did all the, make sure all the ceremonies happened in the Old Testament and, and did all the worshiping of God, right? And everyone brought their sacrifices. No, now we bring our lives as a living sacrifice as a priest who can worship God with our lives. That means we're all responsible of worshiping God and doing the work of ministry in church. And Paul gets into that in chapter four. We'll get, to, we'll get there later on in the series. You are his holy priest through the mediation of Jesus Christ. You offer spiritual sacrifices that please God as the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. In other words, if you trust in Christ, you will not be disgraced. In other words, God won't leave you hanging. God won't abandon you. This world, oh, that's a different story. But here's the thing. Are we putting our trust in man or our friends or family? Or are we putting our trust in God? If I put my trust in Christ, I will not be disgraced by God, but I will probably suffer persecution just as Jesus did. And we already are around the world. Christians in America have not truly seen true persecution yet. We, are, we need to get ready. Okay, we haven't seen it yet. Because in China, if you're having a Bible study, they're going to bash your door down and throw you in prison. In China, they teach believers how to go to prison and do it right. That's one of their classes in church. 
how to survive prison. Anyone want to sign up for that? We're, we're starting that next week. It's a next Steps 2.0, you know. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him, but for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone, okay? The Jewish community that did not believe in Jesus, they rejected Christ, and he became the cornerstone who holds all people together. And here's the problem, though. Those who reject him, it's not good. And he is the stone that makes people stumble. This thing, this, this stone, I should probably bring it up now. This is a big stone. I would not want to stub my pinky toe on this thing. I'm being serious. Why is that? Why is that that your pinky toe hurts the worst, like, all that pain in one toe? Now, this stone would cause someone to stumble and there's a reason why. You can't, it, it's the strongest stone on the building. They couldn't get rid of Jesus. No matter how much they tried, they could not get rid of Jesus. They crucified him. And then he shows up three days later and hangs out with people for 40 days. Almost like to rub it in, you know what I mean? Like, still here. In one day, he appeared to 500 people, and now they're all reliable witnesses in 1 Corinthians 15, it says. You can't destroy life, because life overpowers death in Jesus Christ. So anyone who rejects him, they're going to stumble over him because they can't get rid of him. He's in the way. He was in the way for people. And, and they needed to either believe or they were going to, well, they're going to find out that he's the one. He's the right one. He's the truth. He's the way. So they stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. Anyone who doesn't obey God's word, it's not good. The guarantee of us, for anyone who does not accept Christ, the guarantee is eternal damnation. And there's no easy way of saying that. There's no way to make that soft. It is what it is. But what's interesting is, is the stone is there and gracious and the door is open and he's always going to be there if you're willing to believe and follow and trust him. Surrender to him and become part. Now, I want to throw this, I'm going to throw a stone down. All right, these are my stones and my cornerstone. There's a picture here for you just to give you an, an idea of what it would look like on a building back then. So the cornerstone was the most important piece on the building. The foundation and the cornerstone were connected and it was the cornerstone that would be the guide for building the rest of the building. And the cornerstone, when they would build buildings, had to be a solid piece. It couldn't be multiple pieces fused together. It had to be one solid rock. So that way it would stay pure no matter what would take place, any earthquakes, any things like that. And they would put it down first, and then from that cornerstone, they would then align all of the stones and they would go, there would be a plumb line for vertical, okay? So is the building sure on a plumb line? Is it going to stay up properly? Is it going to tilt the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Or is it going to be straight and sound and secure? But there was also another, so that's vertical. But then there's horizontal. Is, does the building go out straight or does it get crooked? Does the, does the stones get off? And if it's like this, is that going to be secure? If it's crooked, is that wall going to be secure or is it going to be fragile? And what we read is, is that God carefully places us in his temple, carefully joining us together, lining us up properly and the line up and the line out the entire time. Jesus is the cornerstone. And before Christ, the Gentiles were not a part of, a part of it. But this is what Jesus did. He cleans all people who believe in him. 
And then he says, you're part of my family. And I'm going to line you up the way Jesus is. And Jesus is our standard for how everything is going to be in the family of God. And he thought it was worthy to take someone and include them into the family of God. And Paul's talking to the Gentiles about this. Now here's the thing about that. In architecture, the cornerstone helps us know the proper lines. For us spiritually, it's important that we understand that Jesus holds us together, but he also aligns us together in his truth. We conform to Christ, not Christ conforms to us. I'm out here, Jesus. Can you come, can you come be a part of what I want to do with my life? Let, move your, this is a huge stone. Let me make sure I fuse it. Let's bring it into my world. I want to do what I want to do. You're cool with that, right, Jesus? No, when we believe in Jesus, this is what he wants because we don't know what we're doing sometimes in life. Can I get an amen? We think we know what's right. We think we know what's right. And then once we find out we were wrong, we're like, oh man, I was wrong. If you admit it, see, we should conform to Christ and he lines us up. Vertically is the righteousness of God. Horizontally is the, horizontally is the way we live and love each other. So it's Jesus is the line and the standard for how we are to live. And it's not that, that Jesus will do what we, what we want him to do. We would come into him just grateful that he saved us and go, God, it's whatever you want. I'm just happy. I'm not one of those who, who have not believed yet, and, and it's not a good ending for them. I, I'm so grateful that you have shown up in my life, and I want to do whatever you want. I want to be whoever you... By the way, isn't Jesus worthy of becoming like? Like, isn't he worthy of copying? Right? But here's the thing. It's not just love. It's truth. Jesus is truth too. And if it doesn't align with Jesus, if it doesn't align with his word, we as a church should not be uniting around that. We need to be uniting around what is the word of God and what is Jesus. That's our stand. This, this is our lines for living. And I'll, I'll share my heart in a moment about that. But let me keep interpreting some of the scripture for you because this is powerful. Jesus does some amazing things, and this is just amazing to me. It says here in verse 21, we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Now, if you were a Gentile and the apostle is reading this in your house, and I can imagine about 20 people in the house eating together, they just got done worshiping, and, and Paul says, I got a letter for you guys, because they've been believers already, and I have a letter for you to understand more about your inheritance and your relation, your identity, you know, and everything you get with it. And everyone's sitting around in this little house, and I can, I can see men and women, I don't care whether you cry or not, guys. I can see men and women listening to this letter being read. And, and when he says, we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple, tears start flowing down Gentiles' eyes. And then he keeps going and he says, you're also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. To hear that as a Gentile, hear me out, would be so powerful, it would be hard not to hold in tears. Because for thousands of years as a Gentile, you weren't even allowed to get close to the temple. And now you're being called a holy temple. For thousands of years, you were called defiled, unholy. And now you're being called holy, holy. Like worthy of being included in the family. Worthy of being loved by a holy, perfect God. And now you are included. I could imagine if I was reading this letter to the church, people crying, going, me? Really? 
Have you seen my past? Didn't, didn't you hear what they've always said to me? I'm not worthy to come past that wall. That wall that, that, that divides us, that wall of hostility, the signs that say if I come any closer, I could die. You're saying that I'm worthy to the point that I'm called holy and now I'm part of this temple? Are you serious? Can you imagine being in that room that day for the first time hearing these words? Yes, you are part of the holy temple of God. You have been washed clean. He has gotten rid of the dirt. He's cleaned you up, and now you are carefully part. You're best friends with Jews, all, all Jewish believers. You are family. And I am going to dwell in you as God. I don't even know if we realize that. The holy God longs to dwell in us, and he's dwelling in us today. He's washed out our lives, made us a holy, pure vessel so he can inhabit it. That's you today. That's your identity in Christ. Just for a moment, if you've believed in Jesus Christ, would you just say, I am holy in Christ? Because we always say, I'm a mess. I'm, I'm jacked up. I'm dirty. I'm a loser. I'm this. I'm that. There's some things I won't say. And we, we say these things and we claim these things long enough that it becomes who we think we really are. When the reality is we are forgiven and loved and holy, praise God, and God wants to dwell in you. He wants your spirit, or he wants uh, his spirit to manifest himself in you. He wants you to feel him. He wants you to experience him. This is, this is amazing. This is an amazing, amazing scripture for those who feel completely disconnected to God, from God. Here, here's what I was saying. Gentiles were considered unholy and defiled. Now they are being called holy. Gentiles were banned from the temple and distant from God. Now they are part of the temple where God dwells and lives with them through his spirit. Amazing. Well, how do I know that? I'm not just making this up. The Greek word for the temple as a whole, they would use the word heroin or hiring. I'm probably not heroin. So it's Aaron. I don't know how to explain how to share Greek, transliter transliterated Greek into English, but we're going to go with that word right there, which is used for the entire temple precinct. But naios, or nos, which refers to the inner sanctuary that includes the holy place and the most holy place. In other words, the most holiest place in the temple is the word Paul used to explain and say you are holy. Now, just to give you a little history lesson real quick, once a year, the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, and if anything was done wrong, poof, dead. It was that holy and pure. God's presence was that holy and pure that you couldn't, when, the, when a gentleman touched the Ark of the Covenant one day, trying to keep it from falling, he died. And there was rules on how not to carry it. And they were breaking the rules. And because they didn't carry it right, this guy touched it and he died. Now he lives in me? That's amazing and fearful at the same time, right? There's like this amazing gratitude, but there's also like this, this, this reverence I need to have. This respect I need to have with my life. How is this all made possible? Not one thing you do makes you holy. Because you, you're, all of our good deeds are like filthy rags and compared to the holiness of God. You couldn't do enough things to make yourself holy. It's because of what Jesus did for you that you've been washed clean and called holy. So you're probably wondering, well, then how do I receive that? Believe in Jesus Christ that he's done that for you. Cleans you up at the same time. He includes you in our family. But he has standards for how to live. He has standards for how we should live. And with great privilege comes great responsibility. With a great honor comes great responsibility. Let me read to you. In 2 Corinthians, 
and I don't want to be, you know, the word of God, um, I was joking in the first service, there's some things in the Bible I wish weren't in there because they hurt. But, but God loves you so much, he tells you the truth. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. And let me explain that as I finish reading this paragraph. How can righteousness be partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Now, does that, does that mean that you can't love your neighbor as yourself? No, he's not saying that. He's not saying don't love people. He's not saying stay away from everyone who's not a Christian. He is not saying that. The words he used in here is like a yoke, where you would yoke two animals together in agreement to go on one journey, one path, one straight path. When you have unyoked animals, two different animals that don't work together, there's going to be, it's just not going to work out. The job's not going to get done. The, life, the lines aren't going to be straight. We can't agree with the things of this world that's not of Jesus. We won't get along. Eventually, that yoke is going to break, or it needs to break. And we, can't, we can love that person, but we can't say, I agree with you. Because we have to line it up with the word of Jesus Christ. The question, though, is, is do we see ourselves as holy, and do we treat our temples with reverence for God? and keep it clean. So first of all, I want you to understand that God sees you as holy, and that is good news. But because he's cleaned the house, so to say, we want to keep it clean. My, my wife is a really good cleaner. She, every once in a while, goes through every, every part of the room and keeps it clean. Thank God. Because if, if left to me and my kids, we'd be in trouble. I saw a few elbows, actually. No, I'm sure. That's all God's saying. When he says to purify yourself or to keep yourselves holy, he's saying be who you really are. That's not you. Living like this world is not you. Be who you truly are. You're holy. And so doing things that are wrong or sinful according to the word of God is not being who you really are. And it, and, it, and it makes you feel terrible. It can make you feel disconnected from God. It can, it, make, it can cause you to do things you shouldn't do and hurt people. There's a reason why God says don't steal, don't kill, don't cheat. Don't do all these things because it hurts other people. And there's a way of living inside the house of God that if we stay in line with the proper line of Jesus Christ as the perfect example, it's going to be a beautiful, amazing, peaceful fellowship. I want to share my heart real quick. I am grieved and I am burdened by what I am seeing in our world. And I want to focus in on the purity and the holiness uh, of, and the unity that the church needs to have. But I, I have seen things in the past few months. Uh, this past week, I saw something on Facebook, um, some, some scripture that was used so bad so poorly, so taken out of context, so misinterpreted, it was egregious. To, to use it to, to help pe people feel good. And it, and it broke me that I, I had a hard time studying for this sermon today. I had a hard time getting my, it took me like an hour. I was pacing back and forth in my house for like 30 minutes praying, and then I was sitting down trying to pray and get my mind off of it. And the reason why I broke my heart so much is because it was a pastor I went to college with. Church, there is a great falling away of true believers. False teachers and preachers are increasing by the day exponentially. And it, and it made me think, Oh, Lord, help us. If, if, these, if this many people are liking this post and saying amen to it, they obviously don't know the word. And we spend like three hours a day on social media, but we can't pick up the Bible for a minute and make sure we're accurate. 
Like, that's scary to me. That's scary to me. Look, when you, when you realize that you're supposed to be in line with Jesus and the Word of God, it brings a new passion to read the Bible, especially as a pastor, because Lord knows I'm going to be held accountable if I, t- if I teach wrong. I'm going to be held accountable by God if I lead a flock astray. But listen, you're going to be held accountable too if you lead your kids astray. You're going to be held accountable if you lead your neighbors astray. Why? To make them feel good? to make them feel that that they're going to be okay and that God's okay with that sin. Listen, when you conform to Christ, you'll actually be okay with not doing those sins. You'll be happy you're not doing those sins because you'll find life in Jesus Christ that's so much better than those sins. It's not just about one's right and one's wrong. One's better. One's more life-giving, and it's Jesus Christ. It's a joy to not have to go to bed guilty and feeling ashamed. It's a joy. Praise God. I want to read some statements to you. And just so you know, we went over in the first service, so just buckle in. (laughs) Okay, I want to read some statements to you so they don't get misconstrued and I become some video online. You know. All right. We can love people in the world without aligning ourselves with their worldview. Jesus did it all the time. He, he loved people, but he didn't say, yeah, continue to do whatever you want to do. No, he called them to repent and follow his way. To do as he said. And to live as he lived. The world's version of unity seeks... Sorry, the world's version of unity seeks to please everyone. Which we all know... You can't do that. I've been a leader for 15 years. You can't please everyone. Can't please my two kids in the same room sometimes. But in the process, making sure everyone else feels okay, in the process, we dishonor God and mock him. And yet he's the one that knows how to unite all mankind through Jesus Christ. Buckle in, I got some more to say. The world wants you to accept an ideology you don't agree with to be in unity with them. But at the same time, we'll say, this is the kind of stuff I would post on Facebook, but I don't got time to moderate it, so it feels good to get it out today. Just so you know, I don't got, I don't got time to moderate my Facebook. Okay, so I say it in my sermons. Let me finish that sentence. Meanwhile, they say, be true to yourself be who you really are. Now, wait a second. Let me read the first part. The world wants you to accept an ideology you don't agree with to be in unity. Meanwhile, they say, be true to yourself and be who you really are. So which one is it, my friends? I don't know which one to do then, because here's why. This is who I really am. My true identity is in Jesus Christ. That's who I truly am. Listen, young, young people, you do not have to cave to your friends. You will not be disgraced by God if you stand strong and believe and, and stand. Do you do it with respect and love? Absolutely. I would never bash anyone. I don't bash any other religion, any other lifestyles. I don't bash them. I just stay in the strong, firm foundation of the cornerstone that will never crumble. And I do it with love and respect for my friends and my neighbors. Look, if I got to be, I, I, told, I told God this one day, I don't even know if my wife knows this, but if, if my wife disagreed with the word of God, I would stand with God. Of course, she, she agrees with the word of God, thank God. Otherwise, I wouldn't have got married to her. That's a sermon for another day. <laughs> That's a different sermon. So which one is it? Well, here's the, here's the thing about that. This is absurd. The world's way of thinking is absurd. And it was, it's what you would expect coming from a world that has denied any absolute truth. If you deny one absolute truth, being God, in my opinion, then you make up a bunch of other truths. Well, that, that, that truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Okay, which one's true then? 
And if your truth is hurting me, and apparently my truth is hurting you, which one is true? Because we're not supposed, our truths aren't supposed to hurt each other, I thought. Because you, you, come on. At what, so wait a minute, I have to tolerate, I have to tolerate everything, right? Unless, now, you don't have to tolerate something that I believe in but I have to tolerate everything you believe in. One truth is winning over the other, I guess, right? This is why we as a church have to be in line in Jesus and not some weird teaching or some other thing. You, you, look, we're not aligning ourselves in Calvary. Here's, here's the Calvary. Here's our building. Oh, all right, I got, boom. In line with everything this building stands for. No! We're in line with Jesus. In line with whatever celebrities say. Eh. Social media. Eh. That's going to be annoying by the time I get done. No, sure. That, you see what I'm saying? Because there's going to be a bunch of different things that people try to align themselves with, and no one knows what to do anymore. No one knows what's right. That's why the Bible says they'll call right wrong and wrong right. Welcome to America and our world. So, with all that said, if you're like me and you're struggling with the way the world is right now, that's actually a good thing. Because you don't fit in this world. You fit in the ways and the life in the house of God held up and held together by Jesus Christ. That's why you're uncomfortable in this world. In fact, that's why you're uncomfortable. And if you are comfortable in this world, we need to pray. Because this, this should not feel like a comfy world as a Christian. You should be alarmed and concerned. You should be like, where do I fit? I, I don't... I, I, can't, I can't do that. I can't be true to myself there. I, I can't do what they say over there. There's only one other place to go to then. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. That's because that's where home is. You belong. Since the garden, when Adam and Eve messed up, everything was ravaged and destroyed. And the way that God is bringing back Eden again is through Jesus Christ. He's bringing everyone together. He's fixing what took place and everything that got messed up in the garden, he's fixing it with Jesus. And he's saying, come home. You don't fit in the way this world is. This world is not the way it was supposed to be. This is not sin, death, cancer, all of that. That is not what God created and intended. That's what sin developed and produced. I'm preaching to someone in here that doesn't know Jesus or has been skeptical or a doubter of Jesus. He's saying, believe in this truth today. Because I want you home. You've always belonged with us. You've always belonged with me, more importantly. Does this make us better than the world? No, we never have that arrogant attitude. No, it makes us want to to find all the lives and, and help them get cleaned and bring them in here. Man. Hebrews 12, I'm going to paraphrase it so we can get going. Hebrews 12 speaks about a shaking coming. It speaks of a shaking coming. And only those who are part of God's kingdom will be unshakable. And God's not going to just shake the earth. He's going to shake the heavens. And anything that is not of him will crumble away. Only those who are in Christ will stand and survive that shaking. It speaks of the end times, that scripture. It's coming. And the question is, is, you know, are we going to choose to be like this? One foot in the world, one foot in Christ? So when that shaking happens, oh, that's pretty secure. <laughs> Someone built that really good. That's going to be someone's life. 
God wants you to be all in Jesus. And it's so much better than this world. And when it comes to ideologies and teachings and lies in our world, for the love, please don't take your philosophy and education and theology from Facebook, please. 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 Twitter, whatever. The word of God is good enough. We just got to be willing to have patience and dig through it. I didn't, I didn't know the Bible overnight. It's taken me 37 years or, well, I didn't start reading until a certain age, but you know. <laughs> it's a patient journey with God of learning all you can. And I read the same, I've read these scriptures so many times I never took this stuff from it. We need the truth of the word. And I'm telling you, church, when it gets worse for us in America, because it's coming, it's going to come down to whether you are in Christ and you put your faith in Jesus or whether you put your faith in, in something else. Like, it's going to come down to where I could be canceled in silence as a pastor, and I'm wondering if you're going to stick up with me and, and cover my back. And I will be, I'll be covering your back. Now, do, I, do, I, do we need to waste our time on social media getting in arguments? No. I'm talking about if there's a moment where we can't even gather in a building because they're saying no more worshiping God, you're all haters. Well, guess where I'm going to be? I'm going to be with you here. And I guess who knows what could happen to me. If I can't say the word of, if I can't preach the scripture, are we going to be ready for that? Because that's what it is like in China and India right now. Missionaries right there from where? Where are you missionaries from? Yeah. India. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, I met them the other week. They're missionaries from India. Persecution is running rampant just because you believe and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's real. It's real. So guard your life from false teaching. Guard your family from false teaching. And the only way you know what's false is if you read the Bible. Know Christ, know the word, you're going to be strong in the cornerstone. That's what keeps us held together in unity. Amen? Amen. Come on out, Dorothy. Dorothy and I are hanging out together for announcements today, but can we pray real quick as, as believers or maybe an unbeliever? And you're like, man, I didn't realize that Jesus did that for me, that he made me, he can make me holy and purify my heart. I can't do that. If that's you today, whether you're online or in this room, it's a real simple prayer from the heart to say, yeah, that's me. I need forgiven, forgiveness. I need to be forgiven of my sin. I acknowledge what Jesus has done for me. And I put my life and my faith in Jesus. Why don't you close your eyes with me and just be praying for these people that could be giving their life to Jesus for the first time. You feel unloved, outsider. You feel lost. You feel confused on what you're supposed to follow. You have no idea what is true. You just learned today who's true. And the Holy Spirit was confirming it in your heart today already. He was drawing you to watch this online or be in this place. You're here for a reason. You're watching this for a reason. This is not an accident. He's saying, come home. I love you. I will help you be holy. I will make you holy. You, you would never be able to do it by yourself because you need me to do it. Jesus, I pray you would clean hearts today. Yes. Make them devoted followers of you when they put their faith in you today. And God, for, for, our, for us as a church, as believers, Lord, forgive us for consuming all the lies in our world. God, I pray that we'd be willing to stay in line with Jesus as the cornerstone, righteously and in loving and truth in the way we should live. Lord, we stand strong in the cornerstone, not to fight people, but to be a place that shows where to go, to be a light in the dark. We're not trying to cause fights or be accused of being haters. The world might say that. But God, we, just, we love people. We don't want them to, to miss this blessing to be in the house of God, in the, in the temple 
to be part of his family. God, I pray that we, if, if we as a church, as believers, if we have been living a double life halfway off the wall, God, I pray that you would convict today and that we would walk away from those things starting today. And that we would align ourselves to your word in Jesus Christ. We thank you for holding us together and calling us holy. We love you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.